everyone. Um, I would like to welcome you to this keynote session on crisis and mental health. My name is Antonio Larraín from Universidad Alberto Hurtado, Chile, and I will be the moderator of this keynote. I'm glad to introduce you to our keynote speaker, my colleague at Universidad Alberto Hurtado, Paula Danilo. Paula is PhD in psychotherapy for the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile and University of Heidelberg. She is researcher at Millennium Institute for Research in Depression in Chile. She is director of the Center for Research in Psychotherapy at the Universidad Alberto Hurtado. Her research is on psychotherapy and personality, and she has published um, several research articles on the issue. Um, today, she will present her work from social outburst to COVID, Chile's crisis impact on mental health. So it is a great pleasure to leave you with Paula. Hi. My name is Paula Dañino. Um, I want to first of all thank the organizing committee and especially to Antonia Larraín for the invitation and opportunity to speak to you today. Until now it has been an enriching congress and I am expecting to see the other keynote speakers. Um, as you may have noticed, I'm not an English native speaker, so um, I'll try to do my best. My presentation is um, a work that I've done with a colleague in the Universidad Alberto Hurtado, uh, she's Veronica Anguita, and is entitled From Social Outburst to COVID in Chile Impact on Mental Health. Our roadmap will be first to tell you about Chile, uh, to try to immerse you on the social crisis prior to COVID, the psychological impact of COVID in Chile, and also some reflections on virtual psychotherapy. So, first of all, Chile. Chile is a very long and narrow country limited by the Andes mountain. This is not a minor issue, since throughout Chilean history, mountains made, it, made us feel protected, sustained, but also isolated from the world. And as you see in the image, feeling very, very small. I think this is why Chilean people have an ambivalence, in a way, feeling like living at the end of the world, and therefore always looking north, but at the same time, the economic jaguars of Latin America. It's my belief that understanding social and personal context leads us to look at psychological issues with some perspective. And um, for this, I have to situate you a little bit earlier of COVID strike in Chile, that it was on March. On the 18th of October, high, high school students in, 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 initiated sorry, a protest against the fair hikes of the subway system by jumping in hordes over the access turnstile. In less than two days, the main cities of Chile had joined in the spontaneous and self-converted protests. Then, President Sebastián Piñera called on the mil military and applied state of emergency with Corfión Santiago, which the military later imposed on most cities of Chile. The reasons for this social outburst are not to be found in the modest fair hike of mass transportation but in growing civil unrest that has been incubating for decades, due in large part to the non-resolved inheritance from the civil military dictatorship of Pinochet, that was from 73 to 1990. In the 80s, Chile implemented extreme neoliberal policies that led to the privatization of 
practically all natural resources of the workers' pension system, but not the military though, of a profound marketization of health, care, education, and basic services, including public transportation. The economic model characterized by extreme marketization and privatization, including water rights, together with a political system bonded by the con constitutional legacy, resulted in a country with one of the highest gross domestic products of Latin America. Coupled with one of the highest indicators of inequality in the region over Bolivia, Argentina, Peru, and Uruguay. So the demands now flourishing are all demands for social justice, for inclusion without discrimination. They are also a demand for political and economic change. Essentially, people are demanding an end to the abuse that they are constantly subjected to and to the system of privilege based on birth, not in merit. But at the beginning of March, violence increased significantly. With battles between front lines, that are hooded students, drug lords and delinquents that started shoplifting, with the police presence in the zero zones of the big cities. Then, the 8th of March, the International Women's Day, there was a great pacific meeting of more than a million women in the zero zone of Santiago. The light of hope was the agreement for a new constitution. In November, Almost all the political parties in the country signed a document that promotes, promotes an entrance plebiscite. In April 26, for a new constitution, the plebiscite was going to be, with alternatives to write it in nine months and then a plebiscite to confirm it. Mental health was already fragilized for many Chileans. In this time of the outburst, there were mixed feelings, anger, feeling abuse, experiencing trauma or re-traumatizing, fear, family tensions, but also a feeling of connectedness, of internal and collective force, the space to have a voice. Daily routines were disrupted by transport stoppages. The near paralysis of the university system and pockets of vandalism and violence in parts of cities. For many, the streets of each day was compounded by the financial impact of the protests. According to the government, nearly 15,000 business, businesses have been affected by the movement, more than half of which have suffered damage to their property. In fact, the Ministry of Health, during the outburst, reported a 22% 20, increase in medical leave for mental health, reaching 6,000 per day. A significant increase in the number of consultations for mental disorders has also been reported, and almost doubling the use of tranquilizing or antidepressant drugs and an alarming increase in people who indicate that they would like to end their lives. And in March, the 3rd of March, the first patient, patient zero, was diagnosed with COVID. It went, he went almost unnoticed, but then the epidemic spread fast, and, it, and with it the fear of people and the forced quarantines changing everything. In a few days, the team and tone of politics have undergone a significant change. From confrontational language and disqualification, we move on to the discourse of solidarity and unity. From claiming rights to duties and compassion, from the slogan to fight until defeating the other in the care of the neighbor, 
from magical and radical solutions to asking complex questions, such as how many sacrifices are we willing to make to save lives? From the demand for participation to the requirement of leadership. In fact, President Piñera um, raised uh, his population from 9% of approval to 21%. But social unrest is only postponed. Just as the plebiscite for the new constitution had to be postponed until October, we went then from the hoods to the masks. I would like to, to read you something of um, Alejandra Costamagna, a Chilean journalist. Um, she wrote on a magazine, a Mexican magazine, um, a small um, write, um, but I think it's very important and it gives uh, an idea of the feelings and, and how was this process. Uh, she says, we had learned to meet. Finally, we had regained the collect collective hack. We had learned to get out of the first is the winner bubble, to meet our neighbor on the balcony, in the corridor of the building, in the line of markets to buy bread, in the street, side by side, hand in hand, body by body. We had sung again, from our windows during the curfe imposed by Piñera. Seeing the militia guarding the, the city brought back the worst memories of the dictatorship. It seemed like a nightmare from which we wanted to wake up urgently. We were changing and jumping in perfect disorder, confused among the crowd. The streets were filled with graffiti and slogans. The walls spoke for us. Dignified health, fair pensions quality public education. Our canvases were praying, but also I need a banner for all the rage I have. No to the Pinote Constitution. Tile woke up. Or until dignity becomes a habit. The police beat us, abused us, and took our eyes out. But the rage and the awareness of our pre precariousness were drugs that encouraged us to stay on the streets. We were planning a constitutional process that had many imperfections and we were discussing them because we were motivated, above all, by the idea that we would finally change this instrument inherited from the dictatorship. The legal text awakening the legal sorry the legal text that does not guarantee social rights but fixes them as merchandise we were going to be 5 months old in that collective awakening when the pandemic arrived and confined us goodbye hugs hands kisses we changed the hoods for the masks we thought that if we take care of ourselves individually, we are taking care of others. This segment of Alejandra Costa Magna makes us think of how the pandemic affects this social process. The suspension of the plebiscite, the impossibility of demonstrating through the use, usual channels the recovery of a scenario of a supposed stability and tense balance in which the demands and counter demands from both sides of the political stage are put on hold in the face of a more serious and urgent circumstances that affect everyone equally. But I must stop in for in, in understanding or trying to define what is mental health. And I bring here Nathan Ackerman, an American psychoanalyst, psychiatrist and psychoanalyst, um, and he defines very well this issue. 
He says mental health is not a static quality that someone possesses in private. It does not sustain itself. It can only be sustained by continuous effort and the closeness and emotional support of others. Ideally, it is a result of a balanced and creative personal functioning that brings out the best in man in social relationships. In a general sense, it refers to attributes such as maturity, stability, realism, altruism, a sense of social responsibility. It is not possible to live fully and, solid and in solidarity our social being in a system of authoritarian relations in which some exercise oppressive power over others, in which the values that are promoted are those of individualism, rivalry, competitiveness, with success through consumption and social position, and in which simultaneously the inequality of means and opportunities between some of and other areas of society is extreme, nor is it possible when relations between human beings are marked by insecurity, mistrust and fear. So, how are we? How are Chilean people? How is um, our mental health now? In this crisis, there is a constant tension between individual, family and human survival and the economic debacle. It's a big dilemma that can't be solved and keeps choking us from October. With, um, I, will, I will talk um, from, from now on um, specifically of what COVID causes on our mental health, um, trying to understand which are the main issues that makes us psychologically uh, stage. And with my colleague, uh, I put her photograph, Veronica Anguita, um, we did between March 23rd of March and the 15th of April, uh, when COVID was just beginning in Chile, and uh, the figures were over 8,000 infections and the number of deaths were less than 100. Um, we sent a survey with the aim, an online survey, with the aim of asking about mental health. We received almost 4,000 answers. The survey consisted in just 27 questions, some of them were open questions, so we did a um, mixed method methodology using quantitative and qualitative analysis. And therefore, the next part of my presentation, I'll be intercalating some reflections um, and theoretical positions along with some of the evidence we got from this study. First of all, and one of the main issues of the pand this pandemic is quarantine. This is the only way to keep pandemic at bay. The word quarantine was first used in Venice, Italy in 1127 with respect to leprosy and therefore was widely used in response to the Black Death, although it was not until 300 years later that UK began to impose quarantine in response to the plague. This is, I, I, I thought it was a, I, maybe you know what, you know it, but this is a doctor, um, a medical doctor in, the, in Venice in that time, and the, these were their masks uh, that they use, and the stick also to not touch the, the ill people. There is a book called Psychiatry of Pandemics, of Tamir Huremovic. Um, and there he discusses the psychological consequences of social distancing in two words. Isolation and uncertainty. 
all measures of social distancing result in various degrees of isolation. Isolation in social distancing can be quite palpable and physical, like contact barriers, protective equipment, physical separation by glass or lockdown, and symbolic inability, for example, to read the facial expressions from masked faces, feel a human touch on one's skin, inability to make out a human shape underneath all the protective equipment. The other crucial psychological aspect of isolation is uncertainty. Those who are ill in isolation are uncertain about their survival and recovery. Those who are healthy in quarantine are uncertain about whether they are going to get sick. Those who loved ones are in quarantine, isolation or unaccounted for are forced to deal with uncertainty from a different side. In our study, the psychological impact of the sanitary measures of quarantine showed to be much more intense than what was found on research done in other countries such as China, Spain, and one or two um, articles in Italy. What we found in the study is that the main impact for almost 70% of the sample is concern. This can be obviously understood since we have been concerned about ourselves, about our community, our politics from October. Then the emotional impact that followed in terms of frequency was anxiety, that it's something that repeats in all the, all the countries, restlessness, sleep problems and distress. Um, all these emotions, if intensified, um, especially since you can expect that with um, more time in quarantine, remember that this is data from the first weeks, um, uh, we can easily understand or, or um, project that this, symptomat that this would be a uh, depressive symptomatology. It, the, it is all the characteristics of, of uh, a pathology like that. And therefore, we urgently need a psychological support. Other issue that is highly relevant to understand the effects on this crisis are fear and trauma. All the literature shows how a high percentage of depressive symptomatology is due to trauma. Trauma implies fear and terror. This time of COVID can be understood as a traumatic event. For Tille, it would be considered a re-traumatization. It is in this context of great fears and even terror of the unknown, of the invisible, that it becomes a priority that we can preserve and continue to have the knowledge that we had until the moment before we were assaulted by fear. Fear is a psychic state that momentarily blocks our access to memory, in the best cases because it disposes us to survive here and now through the most basic and direct mechanisms. The energy is directed to them. Beyond that, terror, the traumatic, tends to disorganize even our tools for operating in the present and may spread through our memory, making associative chain exclusively with all our previous terrors. Therefore, our traumatic personal and collective history revives with intensity in these conditions when fear and uncertainty reappears. Social isolation and the interruption of recreational activities outside the home, the neighbor, even in people who enjoy psychic well-being, can induce high intensity of anguish 
and its consequent manifestations, such as increased ambivalence of attachments, difficulty in being alone, sleep disorders, anxiety, what we have already talked about. For everyone, our history, conflict, psychic pains, experiences, tensions, bubble up in this context that weakens us psychologically, and in the face of which we have no learned experiences from which to hold on. So the situations of people who are who are receiving psychological support before the pandemic are particularly worrying. How can you cope with this crisis when you were in the process of being supported through the revision of difficult aspects of yourself? That's why our research wanted to ask about this population that is not taken into account in any research and to see how this removal of psychological vulnerabilities is impacting them. First of all, we found that almost a thousand people of the 4,000 were having a process uh, and that was then disrupted. The mainly consultation issues were depression, anxiety, interpersonal relationship difficulties or distress. All persons at risk from the psychological impact of COVID inevitably shakes the roots. We need to do, to do more analysis to see what the particular impact is on these thousand people uh, to answer the question. Um, but what we saw is that most of, the, of, most of them were on virtual therapy with great success. So it will be relevant to evaluate the same impact, uh, how, the same, how the impacts are going to be in next weeks with more time um, of quarantine. Um, and the hypothesis as, is that the impact is going to, to increase, but then um, virtuality maybe uh, it's a way out of this problem. Um, the situation we are going through also contains aspects of catastrophe. What we call a catastrophe in, can be characterized as an event or sequence of events that unexpectedly breaks the attempts of self-organization and planning of daily life. This catastrophe is felt by Chileans, but as it is teamed by the telluric movement of the social explosion, the decrease in economic income appears very strongly as a concern that apparently overcomes uh, any other. Through the Chilean outburst, debts and the obligation of having to use the savings to face the economic crisis is recognized as distressing and frustrating. In our survey, this is evident. When subjects put health concerns and labor and financial issues almost in the same position. That's something um, important to think about. Another issue that appears everywhere I think everywhere, <laughs> is the way authorities behave during the, the phases. And in Chile, authorities during the initial phase of the pandemic um, didn't do it right. Um, in fact, this was a subject that people uh, brought up in the open questions um, telling about uncertainty, concern, anger, surprise um, about what authorities um, said at the beginning and how they manage this complex crisis. Um, and there's also a history in this. Uh, I mean, um, when the outburst was in October, just to give you like an again a context, 
um, the president initially said that this was a war with an invisible enemy. And along this, it was leaked an audio of the First Lady saying that the aliens had arrived. So, on the initial COVID in Chile, authorities did almost the same, giving contradictory messages, but the failure of the triumphalist discourse, the new normality, they say, safe return, categorically denied by the rate of increasing cases, especially the last three days, together with the arrogance and absence of dialogue, increased the population's distrust of the authorities who are perceived as incapable of solving the problems arising from social and health crisis. And finally, I must say that another ingredient to this receipt, which is heavily, heavily boiling, is inequality. The health measures imposed, such as quarantine and therefore social isolation in Chile, show how complicated, how complicated this is. The protest events of October showed the cracks of inequality through which macroeconomic achievements were slipping. The COVID crisis shows how complicated it is to impose sanitary measures when the material conditions to sustain the quarantine that do not exist, as is the case in popular and even middle class neighborhoods. Let's get into other issue. Um, psychological effects, I think it, it is um, something that um, I imagine you already um, conclude from my presentation, but in Chile are very complex. Uh, there are many variables in play and many feelings came along with us unresolved from the outburst. But also worldwide, mental health is getting more and more importance. Some researchers are start, starting to say that mental health will be a second curve and others um, tell this is the fourth wave as you can see in the figure, that will last longer than COVID. Um, and even though, and I think I agree with that, is that this will be the next pandemic. This is because recent reviews of psychological sequel in samples of quarantine people and of health care providers revealed numerous emotional outcomes, including stress, depression, irritability, insomnia, stigma, some of which persisted after the quarantine was lifted. These are studies, of course, in, on the SARS or, or MERS or the H1N1. Um, So what I've been thinking about is um, that we are in Chile in a syndemic. Um, situation. Um, and I like to use this, this concept. By, it's from the medicine and, but by syndemics I mean uh, intersecting global trends among demographics, um, for example age, inequality and health conditions, chronic disease, obesity, that yield resultant comor comorbidities. These interacting health effects and societal forces that fuel them combine to form syndemics or you can say complex knots uh, of health determinants. 
It is also conceptualized as the coexistence in a period of time and in one place, two or more pandemics that share social factors in a way that they are fed back each other and therefore interact, causing complex after effects. In this case, social outbursts, COVID and mental health, health are interacting between each other, composing a syndemic. The second curve or fourth wave <clears throat> until is going to be huge. And we must get prepared because there are alarming implications for individuals and collective uh, health in their emotional and social functioning. But the question is, how can we be prepared? And um, as a psychotherapist, I must reflect on what happens with this kind of help. What about this change of scenario where virtuality is getting, um, it's, it's being very important? Which devices we must develop? Is, is, these are the questions that I am thinking about. So, but what is psychotherapy? And um, psychotherapy is a cultural device. Um, two people meeting um, are um, two cultures in a way, meeting, and um, from Freud and the talking cure, um, psychotherapy has been, uh, has developed a lot, um, but what we can discuss is that one issue or one mechanism that's relevant in psychotherapy is intimacy, and intimacy is the degree uh, in which I can understand the other, but also, and this is important for virtuality, the degree of partner responsiveness that is perceived by the speaker. So, how can we perceive? Is it possible or not when we are not present, physically present? Um, summarizing... Um, the experience of a close group uh, of therapists, um, I can say that this change of format at first caused cause some discomfort in some patients and therapists because for some it is not easy to have a private place at home. It's something that that simple. And children who are also in quarantine often have to be cared for. Others have not pre not previous experience using video calling methods. Over the days we have all changed our minds. Some patients have found alternatives to achieve privacy, such as using headphones or connecting from a more isolated place in the garden or from car. Some prefer not to be seen and are more accommodating to the phone call. Others have found that the form of facial vision and virtual approach improves attention and intimacy. Some prefer not to have online sessions and postpone them until they can be face to face. Because of this reality, um, there has been a lot, a lot of reflections, symposiums, discussion in Chile and I've seen uh, worldwide also about this change of setting. Um, about how the therapist, how the what what is the impact on on the work of the therapist? How do they feel with this change? And um, what are the obstacles of um, making it or developing um, these devices? But I I've been surprised that no one is asking patients about their experience uh, of using virtuality. And I think that's something equally important or more important even. 
um, with Veronica in our survey, it was just a, a little aspect of the survey, but we wanted to know um, of these people that was in psychotherapy before and that then were having virtuality, therefore they had this com comparison between both, um, how do they felt with this change? And even though it was a closed question, but it was very surprising for us that almost 98% of, of the patients, um, they felt that it was rare, um, but a very good experience. Or And even some of them, some of them uh, said it was excellent. So um, I think that this is fantastic um, and, and it is an input to seriously consider this type of interventions. Where am I going with this? Um, I need to emphasize, I've, I've done it a lot, the inequality, but as there is inequality in social economics, in mental health is something incredible. Um, the, the growing inequalities in our country, far from being a benign byproduct of capitalism, are a threat to the benefits of economic development. Um, prior to the crisis, social crisis, Chile already had a very high prevalence of mental health disorders. One, of, one in three people over the age of 15 had had some form of mental illness during their lives and only 20% received treatment of those. In Chile, more than 840,000 Chileans report having suffered from depressive disorders and more than 1 million from anxiety disorders. The health system in Chile is expensive in both private and public sectors. Efforts have been made to ensure that people have access to mental health through guaranteed care for certain diseases, but it is observed, especially in the public service, where almost 70% of the population is attended, that the waiting time, for example, for the first psychiatric consult consultation is between 29 and 48 days. And although the supply and also, also the supply of medication is although it's adequate, not all people receiving care receive it. Even psychosocial interventions where psychotherapy is in are received by only 30 to 50 to 80 percent of outpatient users. It's a huge range. Another just um, I Heard, like, heard it two weeks ago, an example of the inequality, ine inequity and inequality uh, is a study um, that um, the aim was to see which are the vulnerabilities of depression and uh, what they found is that being a woman and with low economic resources, the probability of having depression is 3 to 1. But also that this woman with low economic resources are going to live 18 years less than their more affluent counterparts. And that's shocking. That is why I think virtual psychotherapy or telepsychotherapy or psychiatric devices open an enormous possibility to diminish this inequality, favoring a faster and more efficient access without waiting to the people who need it the most, 
especially those people who work more than one job, have one more than one job, or who have family members or children they have to care for, and who are looking for solutions to their daily lives to sustain their family. That's, for them, it's impossible to be attendant, to have a, a good care. Um, they can't uh, wait too many days. Um, they can't go to a public place and wait for hours to be attended. Um, also, they can't go every week to see a psychologist. There's no time. There's um, in Tile the, the transportation from work to the house for people of, of low income. It's like two hours, one and a half hours. So um, motivation um, diminishes with all this context and. I think that if we can um, make virtuality um, something that they can uh, grasp uh, on, uh, it would make a huge difference in this gap um, of inequality. And I think that for this um, awakening, Tile, um, it's it's a good good uh, opportunity. Thank you very much. I just wanted to put this photograph because um, I think masks must be like that. It's very difficult to look and see what the other are expressing about the loop of retroalimentation it's it's not happening and that's not very easy for mental health so thank you very much uh, there are there are the two males of us mine and veronica and gita if you have any questions and i think now we are going to have some comments or questions antonia is moderating so um that's it thank you for listening